tangible assets move through a cycle from undervaluation to fair valuation to overvaluation to fair valuation to undervaluation, and it's constant like. Now, you cannot say the same thing about fiat currencies, so government debt-based currencies. Those can and do historically go to zero, but a good tangible asset, particularly good money gold, good money silver, these are real tangible assets that are used across the entire, every single sector in the global economy uses gold and silver. Even in food, in the financial system, in electronics, in medicine, and on and on and on, in jewelry, every single sector. And therefore, you have the broadest base of functionality because it, it works in every single sector. That's the function. And therefore, you have the broadest base of buyer. So 100% of the time you have demand sometimes more, sometimes less. And in a true supply demand economy, that's what has an impact on the price or the visible price that you see. In the economy that we're in right now, which is completely financialized, which means that everything has been turned, real estate, everything has simply been turned into a trading, a financial trading asset by building those contracts, those derivative contracts on top of them. They've turned it all into a financial asset. You can sell your house like this. You can buy your house like that. That's not really the way a stable asset really works. That's just the way Wall Street works. And what we're seeing now is a complete unraveling. And what's really interesting, and this is something that I've been thinking you know, a lot about as I'm doing my work, you know, I remember in the 80s when I was a new stockbroker and all the talk was about globalization. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm not so sure this is such a great idea. And we shipped all the manufacturing, well, most of it, overseas, right? Well, now we see the result of that. And we are in a phase that is de-globalization, but... I really actually think when I look at the coordinated efforts of the central banks, well, they want you to perceive that there's still a difference between the central bank or the central bank is independent of the government. But in this next crisis, because this is so globalized, I mean, it's it's not just in the financial system, it's like in, in many sectors of the entire global economy, they're talking about eliminating that separation because central banks are out of tools. So that's just mad money printing for governments that want to spend like crazy. And when you look at what's happening right now in the US between Jay Powell and the central banks fighting the inflation that they created by raising rates, even though they admit that they have no control over the inflation caused by the supply chain and the war between Russia and Ukraine, at the same time that you have the Fed Chair Powell raising rates to increase unemployment so that they can get price stability, workers won't ask for more money when they work. And there's also, if you look on the Federal Reserve Education Department, FRED, F-R-E-D, uh, the purchasing power, that's how much your, your money will actually buy you. Well, it's, it's still at three cents, but we know that we juggle these numbers. So what I'm really saying to you is the game is over because the only thing now, and this is what negative interest rates actually did, they've already gotten inflated away your purchasing power. Now they have to attack your principal. So when you know that the game is over, this is a con game and every and everybody's about to realize it through loss of confidence and hyperinflation, well, what do you do if you create and looking back at those historic patterns when we've had a currency regime shift, they create so much chaos that's going around that you're looking over here, you're looking over here, you're looking up there and they're changing everything underneath your feet over here and you don't even realize it. And it's funny because it's usually all the same kind of issues, right? 
So back in the 70s, we had the women's movement. We have that now. We had the oil embargo. We have the energy issues now. We had civil rights. Well, we've had those issues now. We've had high inflation. We have those issues now. Uh, war, that's a big one. We have those issues now. So there's all of this chaos and it's about distraction. And it's about creating a big enough crisis that scares the crap out of you so that when they come in with their solution, you say, save me, Mr. Bill, save me. You just accept it. In this next crisis, instead of mailing out stimulus checks, they just push a button and everybody's got an account and here's this free money. Well, as we saw on the big test that they ran with the pandemic, right? What do people do with that money? They spend it, whether they need that money to live on or it's extra money for them, read meme stocks, read trade, all of this. You know, that's what they do, they spend it. So when I say that they have this planned, we are entering a period where I mean, I don't know how many black swans might descend on us at one time. These are things that you don't know. You can't say, well, what, what black swans do you see? But a black swan event is an event that happens that nobody could anticipate. So yeah. I can't tell you what that could be. But the system is super fragile and it's stretched really. It's like a house of cards and any little breath could push this whole house of cards over. And while the central banks have done studies on the interconnected nature of the financial system, so if it happens in China or it happens anywhere in the world, it can travel throughout the entire global financial system. This new report where they studied imports, exports, investments, like a whole bunch of different sectors in the global economy and found them all to be extremely interconnected, which is part of why I say this could be a plan because this is a global issue. The events have been globally synchronized, particularly since 2008. So when you have a decoupling of that synchronization, between government and central banks suddenly after all this time, especially when they were working hand in hand, it has to make you wonder. But did they suddenly stop talking to each other? I don't think so. 